Hello, my name is John Lee and I'm the president of Alpha Training and Consulting and I have a true passion for preparing students for ASQ certification exams. I just love it. But today we're going to go over practice exam questions for the ASQ CPA exam, that's Certified Biomedical Auditor exam. And we're getting those questions from the CPA Primer, which comes from the Quality Council of Indiana, which is a great company, a great group of people to work with. Uh, we actually use their primer as part of our online class. We have you listen to all our lectures, take our exams, and then at the end we have you review the primer, and we go over all those questions at the end of each of the chapters with you. And we're just giving you a sampling of that today. We're going to do, you know, one or two questions from each chapter, and I think it'll be a great exercise for you. If you have any questions concerning our online class, just go to www asqcba.com. Again, that's ASQCBA for Certified Biomedical Auditor.com and go to that website. You'll learn all kinds of stuff. I think I have over 10 videos embedded in that website answering every question imaginable concerning the CBA certification. But for right now, let's go answer some exam questions. All right, here we are at question three. An inspector from the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, is in the lobby of your facility. Oh, no and would like to start an inspection. Okay, I have been a plant manager when this has happened. And it's like a plant manager's worst nightmare because they come in without notice, they show up in your lobby, and uh, you have to understand FDA is very powerful in the medical device community, or even the food industry. And they do pretty much what they want to do. If you give them any hassles, <laughs> I had one, uh, company that wasn't that I heard about that wasn't very very nice and trying to keep them out and uh, the FDA ordered everyone to get out of the factory and they put a log chain and locked it said you guys really are you guys gonna start working with us now they said yes sir and they let them back in and then began the audit my point is this you don't mess around with the FDA in uh, many organizations uh, when the F they have procedures so when FDA shows up, you let your secretary know, they call the VP of quality, the VP of quality gets on a plane, they fly out to uh, help with the inspection. That's how important FDA audits are. And so, anyway, that's a little background, maybe more than you really needed. Although your company is regulated by the FDA, you had received no prior notice that the inspector was coming. In this case, you should do what? <laughs> you should drop everything you're doing, make this a top priority, and uh, help with the inspection. A offers to pay the inspector's travel expenses if he and she will postpone the audit. No, that's called a bribe and it's not legal uh, in the United States or with the FDA. That would be terrible. That's an insult to FDA. B suggests that the inspection should be scheduled for a later date. No. Cancel your other commitments and proceed with the inspection. Cha ching C is correct. Deny the inspector entrance to the rest of the facilities. No, you can't do that. FDA has a lot of authority uh, given by the federal government. The correct answer to this one is no doubt C. 2.4, assuming that an audit team breach of duty occurred during the third party audit. In other words, they did something wrong that they weren't supposed to do and it makes them uh, legally actionable. Which of the following could potentially initiate the libel action? So remember who did the bad thing here was the audit team. Someone's going to bring action against them. Then it can't be the audit team. It's probably going to be the auditee. The audit team? No. The audit team isn't going to sue the audit team. Lead auditor is part of the audit team. So B is incorrect. The audit manager? No, they're part of the auditing organization also. Auditee management? Yes. Auditee management is the correct answer for question four. Now A. A quality manual is a static document? No, it should be changing all the time. It should be a living document. So I don't even need to read the rest. A is wrong. Establishes requirements against which current practices may be audited. Yes, a quality manual gives the criteria. It has the criteria and how you're going to meet that criteria. So B is correct. Is the responsibility of all company departments? depends on how you set up your company. But if everyone's responsible for it, probably nothing's going to get done. Okay, So you need to be a little more specific. 
Usually it's a quality department that's responsible for the quality manual. Should be initiated and approved only by the quality department. No, I'd have other people sign it. You want to get people involved in quality so they create ownership of quality. But uh, a quality manual is definitely B, establishes requirements against which current practices may be audited. I also like that term, may be, a non-absolute is always a good sign as well. All right, let's go to question three here. Under the quality system inspection technique, Quisit, sterilization process controls are concept conceptually considered to be a subset of what? Okay, I just happened to work in the sterilization industry for a number of years, so I feel pretty good about this one. Sterilization process controls. Okay, and they always do. When you get a package coming in to be sterilized, you always have this... Uh, page of how you're going to control it and everything else. Design control? Well, it depends on what you're designing. I guess if you're designing the sterilization process, that could be it. But if you're designing the product, I'd say no. Although they may have designed the process controls. But it says, are conceptually considered a subset of design control? Corrective and preventative actions? No. B is definitely gone. I don't know about A right now. I'm not going to throw it away yet because it could be. Uh, facility and equipment controls. Yeah, it could be. In other words, I haven't really thrown anything out yet. That's not a good sign. D, production and process controls. Yes, it's a production and process. It even says here process controls. So which one aligns best with process controls? There it is, process controls. So no doubt this will be D. All right, here we are on question three. Under the EU, a European medical device directive, which of the following most closely describes an accreditation body? So this is an accreditation body uh, for the EU medical device directive. One who places the medical device in the uh, EU market on behalf of the device's manufacturer one that evaluates potential notified bodies on behalf of a member state. And that is the correct answer is B. Now again, this isn't a logical one. You either know this one or you have to look it up. And so it is B. We'll read the other ones. The team that takes the responsibility for the medical device notification process? No. The entity that places the product on the market for the customer? No, they don't do it for the customer. They do it for the member state. It's government officials working with government officials. And uh, that uh, would be logically what you'd expect. All right, so the answer for this one is B. Let's move on to question four. Here we are on question four. Which of the following qualifies as a medical device manufacturer? A subcontractor that prints medical device labels and ships them in rolls of 1,000 per lot to another firm? No, that's a uh, supplier there. A firm that collects used single-use medical devices for recycling sale? For recycling sales. So they're selling them as uh, to someone to recycle, it sounds like. If that being the case, that wouldn't be correct. A hospital that cleans, re-sterilizes, and stores for later use reusable surgical devices. No, they're not considered to be a dev medical device manufacturer. A company that purchases devices from one firm and private labels them for another. Yes, that will make them a uh, medical device manufacturer. So D is the correct answer. Um, but this one can be a little confusing. So I'm going to read from Indiana Quality Council's solution to this problem. So let me get, here we are. Any firm that reprocesses medical devices, repackages them, or relabels them is a manufacturer. So as soon as you saw, purchases device in one firm and private labels them for another, that makes them a me medical device manufacturer. I'm going to read that again. Any firm that reprocesses medical devices, repackages them, or relabels them is a manufacturer. Answer A is a component supplier and not a medical device manufacturer. So like I said, that's a supplier there. And answer B removes used devices from commerce as salvage. So they're just salvaging them. 
and maybe they're cleaning them up to get rid of all the bio uh, risk and everything else. So that one was kind of tricky to read, I thought. Answer C is a firm maintaining its own equipment. Okay, A hospital that cleans, re-sterilizes, uh, they're a firm maintaining its own equipment. So answer D is the only one that would be considered a medical device manufacturer. So that was kind of a tricky one, especially with C there. But remember, if you change labels, you're a manufacturer. Uh, one of the biggest reasons for recalls is uh, labeling, just so you know, uh, which is kind of surprising at first. But if you've been around the industry long enough, it's not so surprising. All right, let's move on to question five. All right, here we are at question five, which of the following quality system regulation subsystems is most directly related to the complaint system? CAPA, corrective and preventative action. Well, that is definitely related. Uh, at least when you get the complaint, you put it in the corrective action system or preventative action system. This, of course, if something went wrong, it'd be corrective action. So A uh, may be correct but MDR, medical device reporting, okay, that's the one most directly related to the complaint system. Medical device reporting, because when someone has a complaint, that's what's supposed to be filled out, the MDR. So no doubt B, and the next one is product and uh, process controls and material controls. Well, production and process controls also, probably also controls materials to some extent. They both can't be correct. So, no doubt, the correct answer for this one is B, MDR, Medical Device Reporting. Question one, for a sterility assurance level, or SAL, of 10 to the negative 6, one would require a confidence level of what? Well, remember what a sterility assurance level is, or SAL, it is the probability, it is a probability that a given uh, sterilized device would go through the sterilization process and not be sterilized. That's the SAL, sterility assurance level. There's one, in this case, it's 10 to the negative 6. Every organization will have a different SAL level, but 10 to the negative 6 is considered to be pretty high. That means one part per million of products that go through the sterilization process would not be sterile. Okay, and that uh, would be acceptable, I guess, for this company that we're talking about. So that's what it means, and 10 to the negative 6, if you want confidence level, you subtract the SAL from 100%. And so if you take one part per million and subtract it from 100%, you're going to end up with 0.9949s. And there it is right there, 99 point, uh, and then there's four nines. That's 0.69s, uh, which is what it will be if you take 10 to the negative 6 and subtract it from 1. <clears throat> and then you convert it to a percentage, is that, that's what you'll get. So D is the correct answer for one. 5.2, no hypothesis can be used to compare a device treatment B with an existing drug treatment A for the same disease state. When the treatment B is better than treatment A, which of the following statements is factual? Well, they're not equal. And uh, all null hypotheses, notice that's the symbol for null hypothesis, H0. H0 has to have an equal sign. So this is H0, it does not have an equal sign, it has a not equal sign. So this isn't true. This is true, but it doesn't match the statement that one's better than the other. It says they're not equal. So neither A or B are going to be correct. H1 is a null hypothesis. It is not allowed to have an equal sign, which it doesn't. It has a not equal. So this is true. They're not equal and it is an alternative hypothesis. And null hypothesis there, it doesn't have an equal sign, so the only one that can be true is answer C. Very good, let's move on to question three. All right, here we are at question three. When a device manufacturer rejects a good insulin solution lot because of erroneous testing. So, it was good, but you rejected it. Okay, that's called producer's risk or type one error. So, and remember what uh, beta is. Beta risk is, it would be stated this way, this beta risk, when a device manufacturer accepts a good insulin solution lot because of erroneous testing. That would be beta. But this one, 
the way it's read there, it has to be alpha risk. Manufacturer's gain, no, it's not a manufacturer's gain. Remember what they call it, producer's risk, uh, a manufacturer's loss. So there it is, manufacturer's loss, a type 1 error has occurred. This is true. They also call that producer's risk, and what else do they call it? Type 1 error, producer's risk, I think that's the most of them. So B is the correct answer. Manufacturer's loss, a type 2 error has occurred? No, it would have been a type 2 error if they would have accepted a bad lot. Manufacturer's gain, no, it's not a gain type thing, type 2 error, no. So it's going to be B, manufacturer's loss, a type 1 error. Very good. All right, here we are at question 3. A proper testing program is most critical for radiation-based sterilization to establish the maximum radiation dose for each medical device because a proper testing program is most critical for radiation-based sterilization to establish the maximum radiation dose for each medical device because radiation-based sterilization can cause device material discoloration. For certain materials, it does. And there are, ta there are tables you can look up to see which uh, materials discolor more than others, etc. Radiation can change the elasticity of the material? Yes, it could. Uh, that's, because, that's why radiation is not the best sterilization process for all materials. For some materials, it's fine. For others, not so much. But uh, discoloration is pretty common. And that doesn't mean that it makes the material bad. Uh, strength and hardness of the device material can change due to radiation. <clears throat> it most certainly can. In fact, all of these are true for uh, radiation-based sterilization. So the correct answer here is no doubt D, all the above. All right, 6.4, the time or the dose of radiation that can inactivate 90% of the viable microorganisms in a population is described by an A, D, or D10 value. Yes, that's the definition of a D10 value. My memory hook, you take 10%, subtract it from 100, you get 90%. And so A is the correct answer for this particular question. Let's get into question one. If a CBA, or Certified Biomedical Auditor, were to audit an accredited testing and calibration laboratory, which standard would be the most advantageous to review in advance in addition to the standard GMP, GLP, GDP requirements? Okay, of course, ISO 9001 is the general ISO standards. Now, I can already tell you, as soon as it says calibration laboratory, the first thing that should come to your mind as far as standards go is ISO 17025. That's going to be the correct answer, and it's right there at C. And uh, so it's worth it to remember that 17025 is for calibration. We've already been tested on it several times, and we're going to get several more questions on it, I'm sure. Uh, but ISO 9001 is just a standard, generic ISO quality management system standard. ISO 13485 contains all of ISO 9001 requirements for the most part, plus medical device requirements. Okay, and ISO 17025, as we just said, that's for laboratories. And ISO 14644-3, I'd have to look that one up, <laughs> to be honest with you. But I already know the correct answer for this one is C. 7.2, what standard provides guidance on the application of ISO 14971 to medical device software? Okay, what standard provides guidance to ISO 14? 971. Okay, uh, that is going to be IEC TR uh, 80,002, I guess, 8002 there is uh, the one. But I, I, you could, I can see why you'd pick IEC 62304. It is about software, but it's through the uh, software uh, life cycle type standard. But so that doesn't answer this question. The application of ISO 14. 971 is ICTR 8002. And ISO 11607, by the way, that is for medical device uh, packaging. That's a very common standard for packaging. Validation of packaging, 11607. And REACH is a environmental uh, type standard in Europe, and it's about, uh, well, how could I say it? It's about environmental 
and how chemicals in the environment impact human beings. Okay, so that's uh, it on question two. Let's move. All right, here we are at question seven. And uh, when making measurements with test instruments, precision and accuracy mean what? Well, a lot of people get those mixed up. But they'll test you on the certification exam on this. So you want to be very careful and make sure you know the difference. Remember, precision has to do with standard deviation. Precision is equipment standard deviation. Accuracy means the average, the average of the measured values to the true value. That distance is called bias. And low bias means accuracy. So they mean the same? No. They mean the opposite? No. Consistency and correctness respectively? Yes. Because it says precision first, and that's about consistency. Accuracy is about re uh, correctness. So C will be the correct answer. Then they, of course, put it the other way, exactness and traceability respectfully. No, it's definitely C. Uh, question 7, answer is C. A manufacturer, this is number 8, a manufacturer received a complaint from a facility user of its medical device. Okay, a manufacturer received a complaint from a facility user of its medical device. Okay, the complaint could not be sustained substantiated. Okay, so it was reported, but it, nothing happened bad. Nevertheless, the allegation required the manufacturer's quality unit to file an MDR. How should the cost of the MDR be categorized in the quality cost system of this device manufacturer? Well, for sure it's not a prevention cost. It could be an appraisal cost because they are measuring, they're investigating this thing. They had to investigate it. It's not a failure cost because no failure occurred. There is no quality cost associated. No, I think there is. There's definitely a cost with filing an MDR, and this had to do with a potential quality issue. So I would say appraisal cost, but I'm going to have to look this one up. Let me see, I have an answer sheet right here. So this is question 8, and I said it was B. And it is B. Okay. Congratulations, you about completed this video. Remember, I have a lot of experience in ASQ certifications. As you can see, I've passed most of them myself. Now, if you have any questions, please contact me through my website at alphatc.com. Again, that's alphatc.com. Go to the Contact Us option, send me a message. I'll get back with you as soon as possible. Thank you, and have a great day. Goodbye.